Hi, this is Alan Gleason for ADSR. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for regular tutorials. This video is an introduction to audio effects racks within Ableton Live. In Ableton Live, there are four different types of racks, audio, MIDI, instrument, and drum racks. The focus in this video is on audio effects racks, but the different types of racks share common features so that what you learn here can be applied to the other types of racks. A rack is a flexible tool for combining devices into complex processing and sound generation chains for use in the studio or in performance. Whether using a single or multiple devices, they give you quick access to the most essential controls. Key to racks is the concept of the macro. They allow you to control a single device or multiple devices in new, powerful and expressive ways. So to start off with, we'll look at two ways of actually creating a rack in the first place. The audio device is in your audio effects menu at the top audio effect rack, which I've already placed on this track. So as the device is telling you, you can drop audio effects here. So I'll drop an audio effect in and it's created an effects chain. I can drop another effect onto that chain and it will place it after that device. I could also place it just at the end of the chain myself, but I can also then place effects that are actually outside of the chain. The other way to create an audio effect rack is that if you have a number of effects, on a particular track, you can select all of those effects, right click and select group or hit the shortcut command G. That will place all those device in our effects rack and then we can set up our macros to affect the devices in the chain. So I'll go back to the first track here and I'll just delete a couple of these effects for now. So what we have is we have an effect, we have the chain and we have the macros. That's what these buttons at the side here activate and deactivate. The one at the very bottom here shows and hides any devices that are in the chain. The button above from that shows and hides our effects chain. And the button above that shows and hides our macros here. So by activating and deactivating these, we get more screen space and we can activate and deactivate the various sections that we want to view and edit. So as I mentioned, macros are key to the functioning of effect racks. By default, nothing is mapped to these. So we have eight macros going from left to right on the top, left to right on the bottom. If I wanted to map my filter control to the first macro, there's two ways I can do it. The quickest way is to right click on the control and map it to whatever macro you want to map it to. And now if I wanted to map the second macro to another control, I look at the other way that you can map. You can click on your macro map mode switch. You can select the control that you want to map to a macro, and then you can select the particular macro that you want to actually map that to. When you're in this mode, your browser also changes to show the range of values over which that macro has control. So by default, when you assign something, it will control the maximum and minimum values for that particular control. But for my filter frequency, if I didn't want total control, I wanted to focus in on a particular area, I could set the minimum to say 500 hertz and leave the maximum where it is. And for my resonance, if I felt that I didn't want it getting too high, I could set this to only 50% so that when I exit, Map or Mac mode. When I alter this control here, if you look at our dial here or look at the value that's been displayed here, I can see that it goes to the range that we set and also my resonance. This is a powerful feature of macros because it allows you to focus your macros to only control the specific range that you want to address. That is particularly useful in live performance when you want to optimize your macros for performance control. The other powerful feature of macros is that you can map more than one control to a single macro. So currently, if I play this loop, my first macro is controlling the cutoff frequency. I could also assign the LFO modulation amount to the same control. I can right click on this control and map it to frequency. Now we can see that when I alter this, it's altering both of those parameters at the same time. So I can rename this if I want by clicking on the macro and hitting command on OR and call this low pass plus mod. So now when I play the sound, I'll adjust the LFO. So when it's filtered down, I have less modulation and it's when it's higher up, I have more modulation. If we wanted to reverse that effect, I could go back into my macro map mode and instead of the LFO modulation from zero to 30, I could change it from 30 to zero. And in that way, when the sound is filtered down, we'll have more LFO modulation.
So even if you're only using a single device, it can be useful to put it into an audio effect rack so you can have quick access to the essential controls you want to address. So let's add another device, drop it onto our chain, and I'll add a third device as well, and I'll drop it at the end. Two methods of adding an effect to the audio effects chain. So now I've got three effects set up in series. I've got a filter going into a beat repeat, going into an echo. So I can map these other effects to individual controls. So I'll map the power on the beat repeat to the third one. And I'll also map the offset to the same one. And then I'll maybe map, also map the grid to the same one. And I'll just rename this one so I know what's addressing to, I'll just put that to B or. So now when this is at zero, the device will actually be turned off. As soon as I turn it up, the device comes on. And now I'm adjusting the offset and the grid. As I mentioned before, I can go back into my macro map mode and adjust the range of which the macro mapping has control. So I can do the same for the echo. So I might have this, this time I'll set the dry wet and I'll set the, maybe the feedback and maybe the delay times as well. So now when I just minimize these so we can see the effect at the same time. Now when I'm changing this macro, I can say that a number of the controls are changing at the same time. So say I didn't want both delay times to be set to be the same. I'll deactivate the link and then now you can see only one of them is mapped to the macro. So I need to also map the second one to the macro. So now when I go back into my mapping mode, I can see that I have options to both set the, the delay division for both the left and the right. So I don't want 60 fourths. I might want it to go to a full bar and then on the second one I'll set it up to a slightly different range or actually I'll even reverse it so that it's going higher and lower on one side so now when I go out The beat repeat is not turning off when it's macro is set to zero, so I need to check the mapping. Yeah, so I can see that it's not going to the range. So the maximum is 127, and I'll put the minimum to one. So it's going to be on between the values of one and 127, and if it goes below one, it will switch off. It's off there. So then it's on. So currently we have a single chain with three devices on it that are processing our input signal in series. You can see below here that it's also given us options to drag other effects here. So if I was to drag another effect in here, now I've got two chains. So this is going to process the signal in parallel. So the first chain will go through an audio filter into a beat repeat into an echo. And then the second chain will just go through an erosion. So the output that we hear will be our drum loop processed by two separate chains in parallel. If I wanted to isolate them or only hear one chain at a particular time, I can set my audio effect rack up in such a way that it only processes a single chain at a time. In order to do this, I need to select my show chains editor here. And now we can see we've got two chains here and they're both occupying the same position on the chain selector ruler. So if I move the, one of them to a separate position and I play my drum loop, you can see in our meters here that it's only going to output the result of the first chain. So in order for us to access the second chain, I need a method to be able to control this selector here. If we do it manually, the first chain, the second chain. So this can also be mapped to a macro. So if I right click here, I can map this to a particular macro that I'm not currently using. So we'll map it to here. So now I have control over this. So when I play, that's the first chain, and that's the second chain. So I could continue to set up an infinite number of chains here for different effects processing, allowing the configuration of very complex and performative effects chains. I can also morph between them. So I'll drag the second chain out 
to go up to 127 and I move its beginning point up to maybe some halfway point and then I'll take the first chain and I'll bring that up to where that one stops. I'll go even further and overlap them. So now when I move my chain selector, this is the first chain, but when it's over both of them, I get both chains. And when it's only over one of them, I'll only get that chain. What I can also do, you can see there's a second line above the chain selector range here. And if you scroll over that, you'll see your, your mouse or your icon goes to the square bracket. And if you click and drag then, you can fade in and fade out the particular chain its own range. So now we can cross fade between the, the effects chains. Just to the left of the chain selector, we have this auto select here. So when that's activated, it will show whatever chain the audio is currently been routed through. So because we're on the first chain here, we will show this effects chain. And I move up to the next one. That means two chains are now selected. I want to keep going. It shows me the second chain only. So that's a single audio effect rack that we've created. I can hide my zones, I can hide the devices, I can hide the chains, and now we've got a clean interface that allows us quick access to multiple controls within the devices that are contained within that chain. I can also have chains within chains, or what's referred to as nested chains, in that at this particular chain here, I could drop an audio effect rack in on top of that. So now that after this effects chain, I have another chain that all this audio could be routed through. So this allows for very complex processing signal paths. Of course, if you've spent a lot of time experimenting, tweaking and modifying these audio effects racks, you can, of course, then save them. Let's call this test rack for the minute so that you can incorporate this processing and speed up the production when you come to producing your next track. So audio effects racks are a very powerful feature for sound generation and processing, whether in the studio or for use in performance. I hope you found this video useful. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for regular tutorials. This has been Alan Gleason for ADSR and I'll catch you again next time.